So th first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me, uh, Eva and Bertrand, to this meeting. And uh, so I have, I have many slides that you have already seen, so I will be very, very short in my talk. So we start by the, as you know, FCR now, uh, and it had already uh, seen NGR 101 plus Corambucil, uh, now as a standard of care of the first line treatment in patients who are fit or unfit with CLL. However, uh, FCR is not uh, effective in 70p deleted patients and is less effective in patients with uh, unmutated status for immunoglobulin gene and with uh, poor pronostic mutations. As you know, most of all the patients will relapse and uh, we don't have any standard of care in relapsed patients. Those uh, criteria for allogenic transplantation are still valid, so it was uh, the next the speaker will discuss this point. And uh, what is the best salvage regimen, immunochemotherapy, monoclonal antibodies, or new compounds? So how we have to deal with the relapsing patients? First of all, as previously said by Emily, we have only to treat patients who have an active disease at the time of the relapse, and we have to take into account the CLL-based pronostic factors. The most important is the duration of the last response, the function of the P53 pathway, complex karyotype, high beta-2 microglobulin, bulky disease, or, or not Richter transformation. And we have also to take into account the patient-based pronostic factors, age comorbidities, renal function, cytopenias, or past history of infections. This is the results of a European survey uh, in 2012. And we, you can show on this slide that the FCR and BR dominate the second line treatment for CLL patients at this time. So uh, many clinical trials have been uh, published in patients in, in relapse, and uh, you, you can see on this slide that we have a high response rate with combinations of chemotherapy or with combination with monoclonal antibodies plus lenalidomide or with monoclonal antibodies alone, but very few patients achieve a CR and the uh, duration of the PFS is very short in those patients, especially in patients with poor pronostic factors who are early relapse uh, or purine analog refractoriness, bulky disease, P53 uh, pathway dysfunction, and it was in purple, you can see, but I have no, no laser, that the, uh, the, the PFS in patients with poor pronostic factors is very short, less than uh, one year. So how to improve uh, the second line treatment? We don't have any standard of care. So for fit patients, we have to uh, look at the quality of the response and the delay of the response. If the uh, relapse is uh, late, after three, four years, you can use FCR, thank you, you can use FCR in patients who didn't receive FCR before, and for the other patients after FCR, you can use BR. For patients who have a very short response, you have to use new compounds. And for patients with the P53 mutations, we have to use new compounds. And an unfit patients, what we can use after relapse? To avoid toxicity of chemotherapy, we have now some choice with uh, new uh, compounds used alone or with uh, monoclonal antibodies. So you know uh, very well now the, uh, these new drugs, the BCR signaling inhibitors, and the more clinically advanced are idelalizib and abutinib. And uh, I think that it's an important point. It was uh, uh, in this uh, open label extension study in patients, naive patients and uh, already uh, treated patients with uh, at 30 months, 
96% of treatment naive patients and 76% of relapsing patients are progression free. So I think it's important because we have a, a long follow up in this study. And the number of patients uh, with uh, adverse effect uh, decreased during the course of the treatment and the uh, serious adverse events are more often observed in a highly previously treated patients. So the ibrutinib is a safe and well tolerable in this uh, study. So you know now very well this slide. It was a randomized study of the resonance study comparing the efficacy of ibrutinib to uh, ofatumumab. And uh, in this study, we observed the improvement in PFS, in overall response rate, in overall survival rate, with a good, uh, safety, good safety profile. And as previously said by uh, Barbara, uh, phase three trial is ongoing with uh, ibrutinib versus corambucin. So uh, at the last ASH meeting, uh, subgroup analysis results was, were shown with uh, in patients with 70p deletion, and you see that it was you have the same PFS in patients with or without 70p uh, uh, deletion. And however, the uh, PFS was uh, shorter in patients very uh, with highly previously treated patients we receive one, more than one uh, uh, cycle of treatment before the use of uh, ibrutinib. You have already seen these uh, results regarding idelalizib and rituximab, so I skip this slide. And regarding ABT199, as uh, previously said by uh, Paolo, uh, I, ABT119 is, uh, inhibits the overexpression of BCL2. It's a BH3 mimetic drug and uh, initiates apoptosis of the tumor cells. So I think that at the, like, uh, the last ASH meeting, uh, very important data were shown in, uh, with uh, the combination of uh, ABT199 plus rituximab. You can see that the overall response rate is very high in this study, 19 percent of overall response rate. Most, uh, the more important data is that 30 percent of the patients achieve CR. And if you uh, remember, CR, very few patients achieve CR with ibrutinib or rituximab plus uh, uh, idelalizib. So I think it's an important point. And also, you can stop this drug in some patients in very good response and the patients uh, had no uh, very uh, rapid progressions as we can observe with uh, BCR inhibitors. And uh, of note, uh, about half of the patients achieve uh, undetectable minimal residual disease. So we have a very good quality of response with this combination. So I think it's a very important point. So what we can do now for patients with P53 mutation? So uh, as previously said, you, you can see that uh, it was a, a worse results that with very sensitive um, method, you can uh, have some uh, subclonal P53 mutation in patients. And whatever the size of the clone, the uh, outcome is poor with a subclonal or clonal uh, P53 mutation. And the, the burden of the clone increased after the first line. For example, it's an example for a patient treated with FCR. So we have at initial treatment resistant subclones with P53 mutation or other resistant clones. And when you use chemotherapy, Clorambucil, Fludarabin, FC, Bandamustin with uh, monoclonal antibodies. You select these uh, clones that relapse and you have uh, patients with uh, resistance to chemotherapy. And I would like to thank uh, Peter for this slide. So uh, at the last meeting, ASH meeting, was shown the result of in uh, 144 patients treated with ibrutinib and with a 70p deletion, 
The uh, overall response rate was about 80% by investigator assessment and 55% by independent review committee assessment. And as previously uh, said, very few patients achieve a CR in this trial, but the duration of the response at uh, uh, the duration of the response rate at one year was uh, 88%. The uh, progression free uh, rate at one year was 80%. And I think it's uh, important data. Uh, 20% uh, of uh, 20 patients, sorry, in this trial uh, progressed during uh, the, the treatment. Half of the patients developed a Richter syndrome within six months of the uh, treatment uh, initiation. So very early after the start of the, after the start of the treatment. And for the other patients without Richter, all the patients has a high tumor burden with a high LDH level, high beta, beta 2 microglobulin levels, and a bulky disease. So these patients do not respond to ibrutinib a long time. So uh, we have already seen this, uh, this, this uh, slide with the, in the IDLA plus rituximab uh, trial, and the PFS is the same, whatever uh, the uh, P53 path pathway function. Barbara has commented the uh, toxicity of b inhibitors. I would like only to add something. I think that for regarding the bleeding, warfarin is not recommended in Europe, but it's possible in the US. And I think that it's more important to avoid anti-aggregation drugs because uh, ibrutinib blocked uh, the TEC kinase, which are in the platelets, and inhibits the aggregation uh, with collagen or with the von, von Willebrand factors of the platelets. So the risk of uh, bleeding is more important if you use uh, aspirin in those patients. And also you have some liver toxicity with idelalizib. So now what do we know and what do we don't know about BCR antagonism? We know regarding the efficacy, very low CR rates, but, but prolonged PFS, which is acceptable because it's achieve, achieved in high risk patients, in a very and resistant patients. We have to take into account the cost effective of this treatment and also uh, the quality of life it's preserved and improved, and it's, it's been shown that, for example, in rituximab plus idelalizib trials, the quality of life increased during the, the trials. We know that most of the patients are elderly people, so we have to use uh, not toxic drugs, and uh, as previously said by Barbara, and uh, we have to use drugs, we can restore the immune function of these patients. And also with the new agents, we have, should be able to target fitter subclones that drive chemorefractoriness at the, induction, at the induction phase. And also we have to respect interclonal equilibrium after uh, one year during the, the treatment. And the question is, can we discontinue this treatment or use this treatment for a limited period of time? So, some unsolved question regarding BCR inhibitors. First of all, if the MRD is an important goal, negativity MRD for fit patients, we have to combine BCR inhibitors with chemotherapy or with uh, drugs, we can achieve negative MRD. In unfit patients, we have to combine with um, uh, less toxic drugs such as uh, anti-CD20 antibodies. And also with these BCR inhibitors, we have to prevent resistance. So we have to combine this treatment with other drugs. So it was a slide that I shown in 2012 for relapsing patients. 
and you see that for refractory patients, two years ago, we used for 7-TP deletion alemtuzumab, high dose of methylprednisolone. For refractory patients, we use the same drugs or the combination with the fludarabine, ofatumumab, and so and so. And for no refractory patients, we use uh, uh, immunochemotherapy. Now, in 2015, for all these patients, we have to use BTK inhibitors or BS3 mimetics alone or in combination. And for no refractory patients, we can ask the questions of these new compounds. So very quickly, take, take a home message. So patients with 7-TP deletion or refractory to uh, immunochemotherapy have very short PFS. They have to be treated with these new compounds alone on in combinations. For allogenic stem cell transplantation, we ask the question to Peter Dreger for the next talk, and also how we have to combine these drugs in the future. Thank you for your attention.